First United Methodist Church, Colleen, it's great to see you here on a beautiful Sunday morning. Let's find someone we haven't yet met this morning, say hello, and let's continue our worship together. team as you find your way back to your seat we have a couple of things we want to make sure and share with you this morning um, the first is you may already know this but the United Methodist men are serving pancakes all morning long in the fellowship hall so at the conclusion of this service if you'd like some pancakes and sausage in your belly you go that way and uh, they are taking a love offering today that goes to support the FUMC Foundation. Uh, the foundation is kind of like our endowment, um, but instead of paying for buildings and things, our foundation pays for ministry and for outreach. Uh, for instance, this last year, uh, the foundation has given to the church $12,000 for mission and ministry, uh, which is wonderful. And so that'll keep coming as long as we keep giving some love offerings here and there uh, to the work of the foundation. So we want to see you uh, down the hall after this service. And then finally, you may or may not realize that there's a giant boat in front of me. Um, vacation Bible School starts tomorrow night. And so we've got lots of kids. Yeah, lots of kids and lots of helpers. Lots of adults were up here yesterday helping us get set up. And, uh, of course, that's why all this looks a little different. And we've got our drummer in a hut today. So... Um, Exciting, exciting things like that. Uh, so we're, we're so glad that you're here today. We want to invite the children to come down for a special message. And children, we're going to sit in this hall, in this aisle right here, okay? So all the children, come meet me. We're going to meet in this aisle here. We're not going to jump on the boat yet. Not on my watch. Y'all come sit in the aisle. Come sit in the aisle. Perfect. Hey. I know. You may get on the boat later. You may get on the boat later. Come on in, gang. And I sing because you are good. Let's get in the aisle here. Y'all are great. Awesome. I think, yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. Hey, kids. Hey, good to see you. I was in Colorado for two weeks, so I haven't seen some of you in a couple weeks, but it's really good to see you again. Um, vacation Bible School starts tomorrow. Who's coming to Vacation Bible School? Yay! Awesome, awesome, awesome. So this giant boat is up here for Vacation Bible School. The theme is shipwrecked, and so this boat hit this giant rock here in the middle, and it split in half, and that's why we're shipwrecked here in the sanctuary uh, for the whole week. And so I'm thinking about captains of a ship. Do you guys know what a captain of a ship is? It's right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a captain. An adult pilot. Wow. That is the boss. Yes. I like that definition. Let's go with that. An adult pirate who's in charge, who is the boss. That's perfect, I think. So if I'm the captain, if I'm the captain of this ship, if this is my boat, 
and I want to see far down into the ocean, what kind of things can I use to see really far? A telescope? A telescope? Binoculars? I might, I might be able to use the stars and use some of the stars. I might use some maps out in front of me, right? There's all these different things I can do to see far. And so I'm thinking about how God is our captain and how God sees us. There's a story today that we're talking about, the birth of Moses. How many of you all know the birth of Moses? And the birth of Moses, the Pharaoh at that time wanted to hurt all of the babies of the Israelites. And so Moses' mom did what? Moses' mom put little baby Moses in a basket, right? In a basket and set the basket. A basket didn't look quite like this because they didn't have Hobby Lobby uh, 3,000 years ago. But they took the basket kind of like this and put tar and put reeds all around it and then did what? She set the basket in the Nile River and set it there. And do you know what happened? Pharaoh's daughter came and saw the basket in the water and saved Moses and protected Moses and cared for Moses. And what that has me thinking about today is about how God sees you and how God cares for you. Did you know that God cares for you so, so much and God loves you and God sees you? Is someone on my ship? That's okay. That's all right. We can deal with it. We can deal with it. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. All aboard, something like that. So God loves you and God sees you, just like when a captain looks in a telescope and can look all the way around. Uh, God sees God sees you. So God sees you today. Not yet. Everybody sit down. Sit down. We're not quite we're not ready to boat, get on the boat yet. God sees you and God loves you. And even when the lights are out and it's dark, God can still see you. Isn't that awesome? God loves you very, very much. All right. So let's pray. And then some of y'all are going to head off with the kids' ministry team to the classes. Yes. Let's pray. Y'all repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for seeing us and caring for us and loving us just like you did for Moses. Amen. 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 Thanks, guys. So y'all head this way, that way. We're not going to get on the boat till later. The boat's just a show and tell today. All right. Okay. Aiden, how you doing, sir? All right. Y'all are headed. Oh, Emily, almost. Arr. This way, this way. Very good. We're going to get on the boat later for VBS. <laughs> okay. Awesome. We're gonna, we're gonna Not a distraction a at all. <laughs> all right. As our children are heading back to their classes, we want to invite the ushers to come forward for our offering this morning. We're reminded that the United Methodist men are taking a special offering for the foundation today at their pancake breakfast. Good morning, guys. All right, let's pray. All right. God, we thank you for the many, many gifts and blessings you've poured into our lives. We ask as we give back to you now that we do so with an offering heart a heart that wants to connect to the things that you're doing on this earth so that more children and more youth and more people will know that no matter how lost they may seem, that you care for them. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Oh, 
Thank you so much for singing, helping us lead us in worship this morning. Um, we're going to do something a little different and special. We're going to invite those who are attending the UMCOR Sager Brown trip. If you'll come meet me up 
if you'll come board the ship with me or something like that, I don't know. Um, friends, we have a team uh, leaving next Sunday to go and serve in your name, uh, to be the hands and feet of Christ in Baldwin, Louisiana at Sager Brown. And I know uh, we've been talking about Sager Brown for a while. I want to take a chance to read a little information from their website to, to help us understand better what it is that this team will be doing and the ongoing work for uh, the United Methodist Church there. Uh, the UMCOR Sager Brown Depot is the hub of UMCOR's relief supply operations. Each year, more than 2,000 volunteers prepare about $6 million worth of supplies for shipment from the Baldwin facility. Locally, UMCOR Sager Brown reaches out to Baldwin neighbors through food distribution and housing rehabilitation projects, engaging volunteers in, the, in these projects that help families and the elderly. At a shelter for survivors of domestic abuse and at a Women's Teen Challenge Center for Drug and Alcohol Addiction, volunteers provide assistance with painting rooms and sorting items in their thrift shops and food pantries. So this is what uh, this team will be doing here for about a week, uh, beginning next Sunday. And so the names of the folks that are headed out are in your bulletin, and uh, we wanted to just lift up some faces and some names. Um, there are some, uh, some long-time uh, servants of this congregation uh, standing up here in front of us, and we want to honor them and thank them for all of their work. Uh, but friends, let's say a word of prayer for them and their work. And God, we thank you for these hands and feet. We pray for safe travel for them there and back. We pray for safe work as they turn sewing machines on and as they create items and as they move things and as they prepare relief kits and flood buckets. And God, we pray that you would ignite and continue the heart of service that you've created in them. And that, God, they would come back and share stories with us that would energize and ignite the service in us. That, God, we would hear powerfully through their work that we are not here for ourselves. We are not here just to protect ourselves and care for, uh, for just us. Uh, but you've put us here to connect with others and to pour our lives into the lives of others, pour our lives into our neighbors, the neighbors in Baldwin and all around the world. So God, a prayer of, of blessing for these as they go and to serve into the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And we've invited Amber Moon, our choir director, and Glenda Haddix, our organ player, Y'all don't get to see Glenda, Glenda Bundick back, back there. You don't get to see her very often. Um, but she's going to play a little bit for us as we uh, send this team off with a blessing. Inside or over the stormy
Ken Smith there is our trained uh, leader that's going to be leading that group. So Ken, thank you for, for gathering uh, the, the team one more time. Okay, so your preacher's been gone for two weeks, and uh, so I got a lot of words stored up. And, and, and so the next service doesn't start for a, a good, you know, another hour. So let's just all get back and get relaxed. Uh, if you want to take some notes, you can today. My hope is that you learn something new today about the Moses story. My other hope is that you find a new way to connect to this powerful story. This is much, much more than a Disney cartoon or a movie from the 1950s. Um, this is an integral story to who you and I are and our relationship with God. So I, I hope that we can make that connection. Uh, a couple of quick words of thanks. First, to those of you that came up and shared two weeks ago and shared your story uh, with the congregation. Uh, that, was, that was powerful, and, and I thank you for that. And then also thank you to Mark Winter uh, for coming and giving his presentation last week. I heard the children's sermon just like knocked out a home run. I heard it was amazing. Uh, I need to call him, maybe get some tips on, uh, on those children. Uh, I also want to thank you for your response to Mark Winter. And, and the offering that was taken in, in his, for his work. Y'all did a wonderful job. It was a, a blessing to him and to his ministry and career. So thank you uh, so very, very much. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this powerful story. We ask now that your spirit helps connect us to it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So friends, Deuteronomy 34.10 ends the story of Moses, and, and it says, No prophet like Moses has yet emerged in Israel. Moses knew the Lord face to face. In the next four weeks, we're going to look at Moses and the story of Moses. I want us to see how significant this story is for us. Most of the Torah, most of the Jewish Bible is about Moses. For us as Christians, our New Testament is. The scene is set for Moses. The scene of redemption and salvation. The scene of God seeing us and seeing us in our need and coming and saving us is begun in this story. So the story of Moses began as a verbal spoken tradition. I like to picture the grandpa sitting around the campfire telling the children the story of who we are and where we came from and told these stories over and over and over again throughout generations and through generations. And then at some point, someone sat down and wrote those stories down and that became Exodus. That became the story of of, of Moses and when they wrote it down they were intentional to tell the people this story ties in to everything we've ever been I want to talk a little bit about that because I want us to see how significant the Moses story is for us and as they were writing the beginning of Exodus multiple times saying through the words they were using, friends, this story ties into everything we are. Let's look at some of that. If you're taking any notes, you, you may want to write some of this down. It won't be on the quiz next week. But in Exodus 2.2, 2, we see this part of the story. She saw that the baby was healthy and beautiful, so she hid him for three months. Um, so Moses' mom saw that the baby was beautiful. The word there is tob. Everyone say tob. All right, this is one of those words you don't have to memorize for next week. But the reason I'm bringing it up is because that word means good. And, and when Moses' mom saw that the baby was good, she hid him for three months. And as we're reading the scripture, we're saying that's a little weird. Don't all moms see their babies and think they're just the most beautiful thing ever? What would happen if Moses' mom looked at Moses and said... Not very good. I don't, I don't know. So what is it that the writer is intentionally trying to say here? Well, if we go to Genesis, and Genesis 1, again and again, we see that word tob, when God creates something and God saw how good it was. That same word and that same phrase 
is used there. So the writer of, of this story is saying, hey friends, do you remember when God looked at all God was creating and said it was good? Well, the same word is used here in the story of Moses, that maybe this is a new creation story. It's a new beginning for who we are. There's two more. The second one is from Exodus 2, 3. When she could hide him, when she couldn't hide him any longer, she took a reed basket and sealed it up with black tar. And the word for reed basket is teba. Everyone say teba. Ah, y'all are great today. Y'all are great today. Teba. Where do we see that word teba used? In Genesis 6, the story of Noah and the ark and God saving God's people through the flood and the rainbow and the promise. Genesis 6.14 says, So make a wooden ark, a teba. Make the ark with nesting places and cover it inside and out with tar. And so in the story in Exodus, Moses' mother creates an ark and places the child in the ark and sets the ark on the water. Note, um, note that the the rule from the Pharaoh was take the baby boys and throw them in the Nile. And Moses' mom does that. She takes the baby and puts him in the Nile just in a protective ark in a way. And so the writer of Exodus again is saying, hey friends, this story of Moses ties in with our story of the flood and how God saved God's people. One more, Exodus 2, 3. She put the child in the basket and she set the basket among the reeds at the river bank. The word reeds is suf. Everyone say suf. Now you have to say it like that just for fun. Suf. Okay, good job. Uh, so the suf are the reeds, the weeds and the things that, that the child was set in. We're going to see this word again in Exodus 13. In Exodus 13, Moses is re- leading the Israelites to the water and in our story our tradition is the Red Sea but a better reading is actually the Reed Sea and we see that same Suf word there and so the writer here just in two verses in Exodus 2 2 and 3 is making all of these intentional connections to say this is our story and it ties in with everything else Listen to that story from Moses 2. Now a man from Levi's household married a Levite woman. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw the baby was healthy and beautiful or good, so she hid him for three months. When she couldn't hide him any longer, she took a reed basket, an ark, and sealed it up with black tar. She put the child in the basket and set the basket among the reeds at the riverbank. The baby's older sister stood watch nearby to see what would happen to him. Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river while her women servants walked along beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and she sent one of her servants to bring it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child. The boy was crying and she felt sorry for him. She said, this must be one of the Hebrews' children. Then the baby's sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, notice that, that's Moses' older sister, comes up and gives a little hint. Would you like for me to go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said, yes, do that. So the child went and called the child's mother. Isn't that convenient? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I'll pay you for your work. So the woman took the child and nursed it. After the child had grown up, she brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her son. She named him Moses, because she said, I pulled him out of the water. So we've seen how the writing is tied to Genesis and to the Israelites' first stories. But I also want to lift up where they were at the time. We want to talk just a little bit about Egypt. Uh, there's a, uh, an author, Adam Hamilton, preacher, he tells us a little bit about this. 
In Moses' time, there were great pharaohs. Egypt was led by kings called pharaohs. And as a pharaoh, you believed you were a god. You believed you were partly a god. And as soon as you became a pharaoh, whatever age you became a pharaoh, if it was 13 or 23 or whatever age you became a pharaoh, you began to create your burial tomb. And it was a massive undertaking and a massive thing. Now, a thousand years before Moses, a thousand years before Moses, they built the pyramids. So the pyramids were already built by the time uh, Pharaoh uh, and Moses and this story comes together. Um, This particular pyramid is the Great Pyramid of Giza uh, for, for the Pharaoh Khufu. All right? This is the tallest, this was the tallest man-made structure for 3,800 years until almost recently in the 1800s when we learned how to build skyscrapers. And so in the story of Moses, as he's learning about what it is to be an Egyptian, as he's off being a shepherd, as he sees the burning bush and he comes back to Pharaoh uh, to make these demands and these requests, these pyramids are all around them, the show and the might of these pharaohs. Now when Moses uh, was alive, they stopped building pyramids and instead built these mighty temples. This is the Luxor temple. And so probably the pharaoh that dealt with Moses Uh, built part of these Luxor temples. Gigantic, huge operations. And why am I bringing this up? Why are we talking about pyramids and temples? Because I want you to know the nature of this story. This story is not Moses and his friend, the old Pharaoh. You know, like, oh, it's Moses again. That's not the story. The story is the singular most powerful person in the world in Pharaoh and someone who was a nobody in a shepherd and a shepherd without any power or any authority coming and facing the most powerful man in the world all around them so to help set up the story just a little bit more we remember Joseph and Jacob we remember Joseph and the technicolor dream coat um, Joseph becomes part of the Egyptian government he saves them from a famine by giving them a story about saving and so he brings his dad Jacob and all of his brothers to live in Egypt and the Israelites flourish they become very populous they grow and things are going well but the beginning of Exodus 1 says something changes. There's a new king. And a new king comes on board who does not know Joseph, does not know the family, does not know the story. And here's where the story begins to change. When that Pharaoh looks at the Israelites, that Pharaoh living amongst the pyramids and the temples and believing he's a god and begins to get scared and begins to live in fear. And he's looking at all these Israelites and he's thinking, there's a bunch of them. This is becoming a problem. And so the Pharaoh begins to tell his people, we need to start fearing the Israelites. This is a problem. If we were to go to war, they could switch and flip and they could come and they could defeat us. And so people be fearful of the Israelites. And in his power, the Pharaoh designates them as an enemy. Designates them as an enemy. In Exodus 1, 9, just before our story we read today, it says, the Israelite people are now larger in number and stronger than we are. Come on, let's be smart and deal with them. Pharaoh begins to teach his people to fear the Israelites. He comes up with three different plans to hurt them. The first plan is oppressive labor. You know, they're all in slavery. Let's put them to work even more. Uh, These people aren't building the pyramids. We already said they were built a thousand years before. But all of these great, mighty building projects that are going on, put them to work. And guess what? That didn't work. God wasn't going to be stopped. The second plan was to get the midwives 
Shifra and Puah and the other midwives and you say, when you see a male being born, you end that pregnancy. You kill that child. And Shifra and Puah do not follow that order. Instead, and listen to this, this is interesting, they lie to the Pharaoh. God's work and God's plans, even through them needing to lie to the authority and saying, well, they're just too strong. The, the, the uh, Hebrew mothers, when we show up, they've already had their kid. And so there's nothing we can do, Pharaoh, to stop that. And so Pharaoh's second plan didn't work. The third plan is the one that comes into Moses' story, and that is any young Hebrew boy you see, you take them from their mother and you throw them in the Nile River. And so from Pharaoh's fear and anxiety of the other and fear of these other people, he sets up this scene of death and of fear and of destruction. But God's not done yet. And God's story works in that culture of fear and that culture of death through five women. And five women are actually the hero of this story. Not Moses. Moses is born. Um, the hero of this story is five women that in the midst of fear and death, they work together to provide life so that God's story can continue through them. The five women in Exodus 1, we meet Shifra and Puah. They are the named midwives. They disobey the king's order. They tell the king's lies. The third is Moses' unnamed mother and unnamed sister who have the child, see that it's good, raise it for three months, and then set it on the river. And then the fifth one's big. The fifth woman who saved this story would not be someone that had God's name on her lips. But somehow God was on her heart and the compassion was on her heart. And it was Pharaoh's daughter who saw the child, knew that the child was Hebrew and saved it. This is not a story of someone being tricked. Um, they didn't make the child up to look like a, an you know, Egyptian and a, and, and finally when he got to the age he said just kidding I'm a Hebrew it wasn't this is not a trick story everyone knew what was going on the whole time everyone knew that they were disobeying the Pharaoh they were disobeying uh, the rules and so salvation comes to the Israelites because the women refused to live out listen to this their assigned hostility to one another God's story works through this place of fear and destruction because five women refuse to live out their assigned hostility. The hostility had been assigned to them by the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh said, we are going to fear these people. We are going to try and kill off these people. And I think that's the place that I've been thinking about this week. That's the question that we have this week. So the question is then, who assigns hostility to us today? Who assigns hostility in our lives? On a lighter note, I remember being a freshman at A&M. Yeah, whoop, yeah, yeah. I remember being a freshman at A&M and the sophomores in my dorm, I was in a rough dorm, you know, where they like to be dirty and not bathe and, and, and build bonfires and things like that. And the sophomores, they told us who we were supposed to like and who we were supposed to hate. Apparently, we were supposed to like everyone in our dorm because we were randomly selected to live there, but we were better than everybody else. And, and we would go to other dorms and we'd yell at them and scream at them. Interesting. Um, we were told things about the University of Texas that I'm not allowed to tell you in a sermon today. I know, I know. We were told all kinds of mean, horrible things and, and, and how we're better than they are. And Amy, don't even get me started about Texas Tech. I won't, won't even go there. But we were, in a sense, assigned hostility to others. 
We all grew up with parents that assigned certain hostilities to us. We need to question these people. We need to be careful of these people. We live in a culture where our friends support the assigned hostilities. We sometimes have to ask, what jokes do we laugh at? What jokes do we laugh at that continue the assigned hostilities of our culture to us? We know that politicians use this. We know that politicians lean on fear Instead of sharing their vision for the future and what they believe they can do for the future, they would rather have a commercial that makes you fearful of someone else or fearful of their opponent and how terrible and nasty and all of that that they are. We know that media companies are paid not to tell you who the good people are, but they're paid to get you to watch them. And they think that the best way to do that is to get you to fear other people But do you know who's really good at this? Do you know who's really good at assigning hostility to other people? Uh, Pastors are. Pastors and churches are really good at assigning hostility to other people. And using this book to try and assign hostility to other people because they're a different culture or because they think another way or because they interpret this book in a different way than we do, And they love to use fear. Pastors love to use fear to make you feel guilty into loving God. And they make fear the way that you respond and contribute and give and commit to a church. But friends, I think, I hope you've heard from me enough that I don't want us to be a church that's driven on fear. I don't want to be a church that assigns our hostility to someone else. I want us to be a church that instead responds to the love that God has for you and the love God God has for me. And that's where we start and that's where we go. So who assigns hostility in your life today? How aware can we be of that around us? And like those brave five women in this story, to be able to know that our authority is much higher than any politician or media or pastor or joke that we hear from someone else. Some of you have heard this word over and over again in in the culture today, xenophobia. Xenophobia, it's the the fear of others, it's the fear of strangers, Um, it's the fear of those from other countries and other culture. Um, Many of you, like me, before we learned what xenophobia meant, we thought it was like a 90s princess warrior that we were supposed to be afraid of. You know, I had that xenophobia back in the 90s. I was afraid she was going to come get me. No? All right. Thank you for the small laughter. I appreciate that. (laughs) The world is not in need of more fear and more hate. The world instead is in need of courageous people. People that feel a call from God to know that our call is not to fear and to hate others and to hate strangers, but instead to follow the example of our Savior who taught us instead to love the others and to sit with and to eat with the sinner and to care for them. So some of us know this word xenophobia. Uh, I want to give you a new word, a word that you may not know. Um, That word is philoxenia. Philoxenia is the opposite of xenophobia. I like this. I got some call and response here this morning. I love it. I love it. Philoxenia, the love to strangers. We talk about philoxenia a lot. We talk about hospitality. There's two places in the New Testament we see this, this word. The first is Romans 12, 13, contribute to the needs of God's people and welcome strangers into your home. In Hebrews 13, 2, it says, do not neglect to open your homes to guests because by doing this, some have been hosts to angels without knowing it. And the word in that scripture is philoxenia, care and love 
for the other. And so you and I both know what that means. You and I both know that instead to love the neighbor, to fight against that assigned hostility is not an easy thing. We know that thinking about that is not easy. We know that a lot of this comes up and stamps on your toes really, really hard because we've all been raised to fear the other. But that's not the word we have from God. And that's not the God we believe in. We believe in a God that loves all. And so our calling is to follow and to do the same, which sometimes means that the things that our parents taught us we have to walk away from. Sometimes that means that we have a leader in our life that we have to ask some really hard questions to. As we continue the story of Moses, uh, my hope is that you see the depths, the deep depths of this story and the many, many different places that you and I can connect to the story, the story that's been here for 3,000 years. Isn't that amazing that a, that a story would continue in a culture and a tradition for 3,000 years? That this story is much, much more than a cartoon it's much, much more than a Charlton Heston or a Yul Brenner movie, etc., etc., etc. I hope that you'll find yourself in this story. I hope you'll find yourself in this story. And for those of you that need a rescue, those of you that need a rescue, those of you that think that, that God doesn't see you anymore, that this story speaks to you. This is a story of a whole people that thought that God had forgotten about them. But God had a plan all along. And no pharaoh, no king, no rules to kill the babies, none of that was going to stop God's plan of coming and finding Moses in the river and protecting him and carrying him, and he does the same for you. Let's pray. God, as we find ourselves in dangerous places, as we find ourselves tied up in the reeds, sometimes we find ourselves wondering if you're really there. God, allow this story to speak to our confidence and speak to our courage to know who we are and who we're supposed to be. And God, for those places in our heart that do have fear of others, allow us to be challenged by that and have a place where you can come and show us new ways of thinking, new ways of loving, new ways of opening our hearts to the other. Um, just as the daughter of Pharaoh did that day, the daughter of Pharaoh who did not have your name on her lips but God you were on her heart allow us to have that same compassion in our lives so that we might be about bringing your kingdom here on this earth today in Christ's name we pray Amen we've come to, to the time in our service for prayer if you would like to come to the altar rail somewhere around the, the ship, that would be great. Um, when it comes time for the Lord's Prayer, the words for that will be on the screen if you need them.
prayer this morning for this space over the next week as children come and children hear that same story that they are valuable that they are loved and that they are worthy and in a world that wants to tell them that they need to be different and they need to be someone else before they're good allow them to hear a word this week that your love supersedes any of that mess and that you love them just as they are right now. God, for everything that we carry on our chest this morning, we bring to you and we place at the foot of the cross. We do so that knowing that you are our Savior. And we do so with the prayer that you taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. 
If you're interested in joining with us at First United Methodist Church, Colleen, uh, once a month we have a welcome meal that we would love to get you on that invitation list to let you hear a little bit more about the church. Um, I'd also love to spend some time in my office with you and talk to you more about uh, this place and more about uh, the Methodist way of being a faithful Christian. Uh, if you'd like that, please make sure and let us know. You've got a white registration pad in your pew. Please let us know that you're here. Update any information. We would absolutely love that. Um, but again, thank you for blessing us with your presence this morning at church. And let's stand and sing our hymn as we head out this morning. we got to get the right words up there. First. There it is. Okay, ready? One, two. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil while we remain. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like fire in our very souls. joy and the peace and the love of Jesus Christ be with you. May it fill you up and find ways this week to pour out of your lives into the lives of those around you that they may know the peace of God. Go in that peace. Amen.